welcome everyone to the Southern Rockies Landscape Conservation Cooperative webinar. My name is Mary McFadden, and I'll be hosting today's event. I am the Communications and Science Outreach Specialist for the Southern Rockies LCC. With us today is Megan Friggin. Megan's presentation is on assessing the vulnerability of riparian wildlife to the interactive impacts of climate change and fire within New Mexico. Before we start, I have a few things to go over with you. Just so you all know, uh, everybody is on mute for now. At the end of Megan's presentation, you'll be able to ask her questions or provide comments via phone, or you can also type in your questions via the chat box and send to the host. Just, just to let you know also, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be available on the Southern Rockies LCC website, hopefully within a week. Our next webinar is on June 18th. Lindsay Reynolds, who's with the Colorado State University and the USGS, will be presenting on climate change and repairing forest communities. You can check the Southern Rockies LCC website for information uh, about the webinar as well as how to attend. So I would now like to introduce Megan. Megan is a postdoctoral post research ecologist with the USDA Forest Service Rocky Mountain Research Station in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Her current work focuses on the development of methods and models for assessing climate and fire disturbance impacts to wildlife habitat and cultural resources. Her recent projects include a cross-cut, sorry, a cross-site analysis of open space decision-making processes in southwest urban wildlands. Megan has also developed several vulnerability assessments for wildlife species in Arizona and New Mexico. Welcome, Megan. Right. Thank you for such a nice introduction, and hello, everybody. I'm very excited to be here today, and um, I thank you for logging on to see this presentation. So today I'm going to talk about some uh, work that the Rocky Mountain Research Station has been doing for a project that was jointly funded by the Southern Rockies and Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. And I put the title up on this slide because I decided when putting this presentation together that I would do well to describe the entire project, and so I'll definitely talk about species niche models and fire risk maps, but I'll also talk about how we're integrating those into um, assessments of vulnerability that can inform adaptation management. And so that was a big theme of this project, and so it seemed to make sense to include it in today's talk. And so as the title says, we were very interested in assessing the vulnerability of riparian obligate species, particularly species that inhabited the Rio Grande Bosque or riparian forest. Um, as it lies within New Mexico. And we were interested in uh, creating an assessment tool that would allow us to look at the interactive effects of fire, hydrological variation, and climate change on species habitat. And so right here I have the outline of our study area, which we selected by selecting sub-basins that were adjacent to the Rio Grande. And so most of our analyses are conducted within this area. And you'll be seeing this shape a lot as the presentation goes. So we're focused within a southwestern aquatic system, a riparian system. And um, these systems in the southwest are um, often in a degraded state due to flow modifications from dams and reservoirs, invasive species, um, water withdrawals from, for agriculture and human consumption. Add to this some of the pressures expected under climate change where we expect increasing drought, more extreme weather, um, disrupted disturbance regimes like increases in fires as well as flood events, <coughs> or I should say the magnitude of flood events, and then all the consequences of this for ecosystems. Um, we start to see concern for conserving these habitats and the species which rely upon them. And so I have a couple um, excerpts from studies and reports here just to show you some of the expectations under climate change for riparian systems. Here at the top we have um, a pretty significant decrease in runoff by the late mid-century. We also see some uh, species extinctions expected by that same time period. Also of concern are the effects of warming temperatures on snowpack. And so this is a study from USGS, and it's uh, covering four different areas. CRM stands for the Central Rocky Mountains. We have the Pacific Northwest, the Southern Rocky Mountains, which are really relevant for our study system, um, the Rio Grande and the Sierra Nevada. And so for all these systems, you can see by the year 2090, there is a pretty substantial decline in snowpack. And for the Southern Rockies and the Sierra Nevada, 
it essentially disappears entirely. And this is a source of concern because much of the spring and summer flows in the Rio Grande are dependent on snowpack. Here's another example of some expected changes under climate. Here we're looking at habitat changes. Um, this comes from a study by Rayfelt et al. Um, they have conducted uh, uh, ecological niche analysis for tree species and biomes. I'm showing you the biomes here. For the entire western U.S. as well as Mexico, I believe. And so I've clipped this out, obviously, for New Mexico and in our study area. And you can see um, here's our current distributions of the biome habitats. And so we have this Chihuahua Desert scrub. And if you look over time by the year 2090, you see that the conditions associated with that Chihuahua Desert scrub habitat expand greatly in our study area. As well, if we look in these more northern areas, these are higher elevation sites, we have habitats or biomes, excuse me, like the Rocky Mountain subalpine conifer forest where the uh, habitat or the conditions associated with that habitat disappear almost entirely by the end of the uh, century. And so these are very dramatic changes and the consequences for wildlife are likely to be equally dramatic. And so this presents uh, challenges for wildlife management. First of all, you have multiple interacting potential climate effects with the actual changes in temperature and hydrological um, conditions, as well as what it might mean for species and the disturbance regimes. And there's some uncertainty added to this with um, what exactly the future climate conditions will look like. There's some variation amongst the models. And so while we need adaptation plans for these species to help prepare for these climate impacts, we often lack the information and the tools that we need to actually be able to um, plan and implement them. And so we developed a framework for integrating multiple types of data inputs to produce a series of vulnerability assessment products specifically to help inform the adaptation planning process. And um, in this project, we apply this to 12 species inhabiting the Rio Grande Bosque. So our approach is based on this concept of climate change vulnerability. And this is a very important concept within our climate change research. Essentially, it says that the cumulative impact of climate effects um, can be measured in vulnerability, which is comprised of three main elements. You have exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And um, so your exposure could be a exposure to a disturbance or change, and that can vary across the landscape. Sensitivity uh, in response, so then you have your sensitivity in response to this exposure, and that often varies among species or different habitats. And collectively, these represent the potential impact of climate for whatever your study system is, and for us it's species, of course. But in order to really gauge vulnerability, you also have to include this element of adaptive capacity. And these can be traits that help a species um, either resist or bounce back from this potential impact. And so by considering all these elements, you get this measure of vulnerability, and then you can start to compare amongst your species or habitats um, relative vulnerability, which helps you prioritize management actions. But also, you can start to identify intervention, man management intervention points where maybe you focus on your most sensitive species, or you can identify actions that will help increase adaptive capacity. And for this reason, vulnerability assessments, which uh, calculate vulnerability are often a uh, step towards or uh, a step included in the adaptation management planning process. And so when we talk about wildlife and climate change research, the great majority of um, research is focused on estimating potential impact. And a great example of this are these climate envelope models where you're looking at species response to some exposure, some condition change. And these are really great um, methods for measuring the magnitude of impact. And you can also infer something about sensitivity within your system, where if you have a species whose range shifts substantially, they might be deemed more sensitive than a species that has a very little uh, shift in its range under different climate conditions. And so we use these tools in our own project that I'm talking about today. But as my circle is showing you here, um, this doesn't include all the elements of vulnerability. We're missing this adaptive capacity component. So most of the time, these models are missing measures of dispersal, uh, reproduction, and uh, biotic interactions that also influence how climate will ultimately impact that species. And so for that reason, 
in this project, we also include some elements of vulnerability assessment methods so that we can address um, vulnerability in this entire concept. So here's the framework that we developed to integrate these products. We have a couple models that we use to estimate impact. So we have our ecological niche models that we use to look at climate effects on uh, species habitat. And from this, we create these habitat change maps. We also use fire simulation models to give us predicted future fire regime characteristics. And then we integrate that with the habitat change ma uh, models to create these fire risk maps. To score some of those adaptive capacity, those non-modeled inputs, we use a vulnerability scoring system and create um, species vulnerability scores that representing those other uh, characteristics that might influence how they're ultimately affected. And then we use something called a risk analysis matrix to combine these spatially explicit habitat maps with these species scores. And risk analysis matrices are really a handy way to start to identify um, adaptation management needs. We took a scenario-based assessment approach with this project. And so we did that by selecting three unique, um, three outputs from three models that performed decently well in the Southwest. Of course, these, of course, these climate models, they um, are better in some uh, regions than others. And so these um, did pretty decent for the Southwest and its monsoonal moisture and everything, but they also represent unique climate, future climate scenarios. And so we have our mild scenario here where you can see increasing temperature over time. Um, by the end of the century, I think you have five degrees increase. And then you have precipitation. This uh, dashed line is representing that 2090 time period. And you can see, though, you have a decline in the spring precipitation you get a pretty big increase in monsoon precipitation. And so ultimately, this model predicts by the end of the century, we'll have uh, warmer but slightly wetter conditions. Our intermediate climate model shows you similar temperature increases. It's a little bit hotter under this scenario. And the precipitation, that mean annual precipitation um, by 2090 is actually um, slightly drier. But you can see it doesn't look uh, hugely different amongst these different time periods. And then we have our harsh scenario where, again, we get pretty stable increases over time in temperature. It's a little bit hotter again in this scenario, but precipitation is, here we go, is much lower um, in the spring and during that monsoon season. So I don't know if I identified that, but that's our late summer and early fall period. And so we have our warmer, slightly wetter scenario, our uh, hotter, slightly drier, and then our hotter, much drier scenario. And so all of our climate data, as well as the hydrological variables like runoff and evapotranspiration and things that we use in our models, we got from the Bureau of Reclamation's recent project. And so they have um, downscaled and bias corrected a series of projections, and it's nice to have um, everything from the same source, and it's already, I guess, done for you. So um, great resource here. So we use these scenarios to develop ecological niche models for our 12 species. And so here are our 12 species. Um, we started out with a fairly long list of species of conservation interest. We sent them out to various folks. We started looking at whether or not there was data enough to be able to run the models, um, observation data, that is. And this is the short list we ended up. And we tried to cover all the different taxa groups. So we have some birds, three bird species. We have a couple amphibians. We have some reptiles. And then we have some mammal species. And a couple of these, the southwestern willow flycatcher and the New Mexico meadow jumping mouse, are on the federally endangered species list. Um, the western yellow-billed cuckoo has just recently been designated threatened. Um, and so we have covered some of those. But some of these species aren't necessarily um, on a list or considered in population declines, but rather represented some habitat. And again, we had data available that we could model it. And so most of the data that we gathered was from museum records. And I've given you the website down here. And then we also used a couple studies for the birds and the meadow mouse, or the jumping mouse. And we used MaxEnt, a maximum entropy method, to model suitable, suitable habitat for these species. So essentially what Maxent does is it creates a probability surface for species 
based on the relationship between the species presence and the environmental conditions where it's been um, located. And so this is a very popular uh, software package to use for this type of analysis. In part, it's pretty user friendly, but it's also demonstrated to be well suited for presence only analysis, which museum database analyses are going to be. Um, it's also pretty good with low sample sizes, which turned out to be pretty handy for our purposes as well. So we created unique models for each species or species groups. The bird species um, we gave the same model to. And so using the literature and conversations with experts, we pre-selected variables out of here, um, out of the suite of variables you see down here, environmental data, that we thought would be most predictive of the habitat. We didn't just want to throw everything in and uh, spit some numbers out. And so what we were working with, what we selected from, we have these 19 bioclimate variables. Um, this is pretty standard in species niche analysis. There are just various summaries of temperature and precipitation, um, monthly, seasonal, and annual scales. We used five hydrological variables. We had four biophysical variables, of which distance to water tended to be the most important predictor of species presence in our models. And then we had one biome data layer, which uh, is that Rayfeld analysis that I showed you earlier. And so we included that just to see whether we could pick up some um, patterns with respect to those biomes. So what MaxLink gives you is this logistic output on the far right of your screen here. And essentially what this represents is where, as colors get warmer, you have a greater likelihood of finding the species there. Those are the areas that represent most closely the areas where it's been found. Now to project this into the future, we took that modeled relationship for the current distribution, that's what I was just showing you, and then we asked where under these future climate scenarios do we find similar conditions? So what happens to those uh, suitable habitat areas? And we did that for three time periods. So we have 2030, 2060, and 2090, which I was already talking about with the climate data. And this actually represents um, 20 year averages. So 2030 covers a period from 2020 to 2040. And you average that to deal with some of the variation that you can get between decades. So what you get here is you're going to get three outputs, this logistic output for each of your climate scenarios. But you can't really do anything with it. You can't measure um, change in area or shifts in habitat from logistic output. So you have to translate it into a binomial layer. And so you essentially pick a threshold above which you say habitat's considered suitable and below which it's not suitable. And that gives you these uh, middle graphics here where you see more of a black and white scene. And so these are very helpful, and I'll show you some images of them for looking at differences in those different scenarios um, and maybe scenario practice exercises. But for the most part, what I'm going to show you today are these consensus layers where we overlay each of those three and develop a map that looks like this. So red indicates where all three models are predicting suitable habitat, orange two models, and then where only one model predicted suitable habitat, we have yellow. <coughs> So I create these consensus layers, and I also create what I call two-thirds consensus layers, where I will take this down another step and say anything that had two or more models agree that there was suitable habitat is suitable, anything less is not suitable. So that kind of takes you to that uh, one-zero layer again. So this is what it looks like. Here's our endangered southwestern willow flycatcher. Um, this is suitable habitat as predicted by the three models. This is just our consensus map. For current time periods, you can see um, it's really tracking the river and some of these uh, higher elevation riparian sites as well. And there's a lot of red. There's a lot of consensus amongst the models at this point. And that's good because technically nothing has changed. Now, if we look in 2060 and then at the end of the century, you see that there's a pretty dramatic um, loss in those areas predicted to contain suitable conditions for this species. And there's also some loss of consensus. Only under that most mild scenario are a lot of these higher elevation sites still showing up as suitable. However, um, there are areas where you can see all three models. So even under the harshest scenario, um, this area is predicted to be suitable for this species throughout the next 90 years or so. Now I'm going to show you um, some excerpts from uh, the final report and the species reports that we have. And so if you go to those, you'll see images more like this. But it's, 
it's the same exact thing. We're looking at a number of models, but the darker the color, the more models are in agreement. And I wanted to just show you a range of uh, outcomes that we got from this analysis. So here we have the western painted turtle, and I have its distribution map down here. You can see within our hot, dry state of New Mexico that these animals really stick to the big water bodies, so the Rio Grande and the Pecos rivers. And if you look at what the model shows us over time, you see a pretty dramatic decline. And interestingly, you see that all the models pretty much agree on this as well. There's not a lot of divergence over time under any of these scenarios. And as it turns out, the western painted turtle, one of the most important predictors for this animal in our models was biome. And in particular, it had a negative association with water bodies that were located in semi-desert grasslands and a positive association with water bodies located in plains grasslands. And I think I'm remembering that right. And so essentially what happens here is the semi-desert grasslands overtake a lot of this area along with that the Chihuahua desert scrub, or at least the habitat starts to um, favor those types of habitats. And so um, you see a pretty dramatic decline for this species. Now whether or not the western painted turtle is actually associating with the vegetation within those biomes or whether it's more associated with the conditions associated with those biomes, we can't tell at this point. But um, it is interesting to note, particularly with its limited distribution in this state. Here we have the hispid cotton rat. Now this is one of the species that isn't necessarily of conservation concern, um, but we wanted to include it for a couple of reasons. One, it has a southerly range, and so that's always nice when you have species that don't um, inhabit your entire study area to be able to see if you can see shifts in distribution. As well, it inhabits a pretty specific niche within the riparian areas. It really likes these areas with dense grasses and sedges. It makes runways. Um, it also has a demonstrated uh, pretty dramatic population decline when it loses that vegetation, presumably due to increased predation. And it also appears to be sensitive to um, storms and flood events. And so it's just a good species when you're looking at climate change to include. So up here we have uh, our current distribution. Again, you see a lot of black, a lot of consensus amongst the models. And then as you go through time, you see what essentially amounts to almost a twofold increase in, uh, in suitable habitat within our study area. However, none of that overlaps with its current range. So this is a total replacement of habitat, which is not necessarily a positive thing for the species. It's fairly sessile. And um, has these specific habitats. And so, uh, interesting result. This is one of the most dramatic changes we saw amongst our species. And there's actually pretty good consensus among the models for some of these areas as well. So we have the long-legged myotis here. We included these myotis bat species as kind of a surrogate for the bats that we initially had on our list, but we couldn't get enough data points for. And so, this myotis is a species that's associated with water bodies, but it's really a forested species. And so it also gave us the opportunity to look at how these models would work with something that isn't like so closely tied to the distance to water variable. And so these myotis are fairly widespread, locally common. Here's its current predicted di distribution on this first graphic here, and pretty good model consensus. So uh, where the arrow is right now, this is the Gila forest. For those of you that know this area, what we're seeing up here, this is like the foothills of the Jemez around here, so these are the mountains outside Albuquerque. And what you see over time, especially if we look at just where all those models agree, is a really dramatic decline in those areas where, um, where there's suitable habitat for this species. However, this is also interesting to note that we have all this light gray, which is represented by our most mild, by the runs under our most mild climate scenario. And actually, when you look at this and look at overall change in the area of suitable habitat, what you find is that under that mild scenario, there's actually a 50% increase in potential available suitable habitat, whereas under any of those drier scenarios, you see an almost 90% decrease in suitable habitat. And so this species was our most sensitive to climate variables. Um, it, that's a very different response to get for what are kind of slightly different um, changes in precipitation. And so it may be that this species is going to be quite sensitive to changes in precipitation in the future. And so at this point, we're talking about climate and, and that biome, which is also climate. 
Now we need to integrate fire into this data and see how this will compound maybe some of these uh, some of these observations that we've been making from our distribution analysis. And so to create to do this, we created fire risk layers for our species. And to do that, we relied on this wildfire risk assessment framework that was developed by Scott et al. And we modified it a bit, but the idea is very much the same. And that idea being that you have some distribution of your highly valued resource or asset, and you use that and you overlay it with some output from fire models that tell you something about burn probability, intensity levels. And using what they're calling a response function, you identify whether or not your highly valued resource is going to be negatively impacted by these various different types of wildfires. And so for our study, our highly valued resource is, of course, those, um, those uh, estimations of suitable habitat for our species. To estimate wildfire likelihood and intensity, we use the Large Fire Simulation System, or FSIM for short. FSIM's a uh, really nice sim uh, system. It simulates large fires on an annual basis. It incorporates the effects of fire suppression. Um, so essentially what you are getting out of this when it tells you something about fires are is a description of those very large fires that have escaped suppression. So there tend to be the less frequent fires um, that you have on the landscape, but they also tend to be associated with the greatest damage and potential changes to ecosystems. It uses uh, these layers that you can get readily from the land fire project, and it uh, outputs um, several variables. Here I have overall burn probability, relative burn probability, and mean fire line intensity. And so this work was actually conducted by a couple of colleagues in the Fire, Fuel, and Smoke Science Program in the Rocky Mountain Research Center. And, oh yes, yeah, so. Uh, this is just to show you what some of that output looks like. So here we have mean annual burn probability. Um, so burn probability can essentially be read as the inverse of the fire return interval. So if we look down here at our highest uh, amount here, we have 0.05. That essentially is a fire every 20 years. And the way FSIM works, it has unique fuels models and fire suppression models um, for each fire planning unit, which is the way it breaks up the landscape. And our study area actually uh, encompasses three fire planning units. We had one at a southern area, kind of middle area, and a northern area. And so there was uh, three separate runs that were put together. And so you see a little bit of a break in this graphic. But that doesn't mean that you're not getting a higher burn probability in this uh, lower elevation Gila forest versus some of the forests up top. However, rather than comparing north versus south, we want to really look at this over time. And so. As we progress through time, what's really notable about this is that you're getting an almost doubling of the burn probability in any given area um, by year 2090. So this is pretty dramatic. Now, to create a fire risk map, though, we have to take that information and incorporate it in such a way that's meaningful for looking at wildlife habitat. And to do that, we created these fire type layers. And so we grabbed a couple um, additional data inputs from that land fire biophysical setting data this time, um, in particular vegetation type and canopy base type information for the study area. We used vegetation type to categorize our landscape into these four categories, for shrub, grass, and non-veg. And then we used the canopy base height in combination with conditional flame length to, um, to uh, categorize these further as either torching or non-torching type fires. So essentially what we said was if conditional flame length was greater than canopy base height at any given area, then you were likely to have a torching type fire. If conditional flame length was less than canopy base height, you were likely to have a non-torching fire. And so what you end up with is what you see on the far right. So we have shrubs with torching, without torching, forest with and without torching, and then grass or non-veg, you know, any flame length that's going to reach the top of that. So we use these categories to create a uh, species response matrix. And so here you see our species on the left here, those categories across the top. And then using the literature and a lot of reports, we went through and we tried to determine whether or not we thought each of these types of fires would, uh, would pose a potential risk to the species or perhaps even a benefit. 
And so I should mention, you know, these fire types, this isn't the fire type like you would get from Flame Map or any of these other uh, programs. This is more a fire type that's supposed to indicate the relative impact to species habitat. So we assume where there's forest and there's a likelihood of getting these scorching type fires that we're probably going to get a greater degree of change um, in that area than in a similar forest that may not have fire conditions that will lead to torching fires. And so it's kind of this gradient of torching being a little bit more dramatic than the non-torching fires. And then two different habitats, of course, because these species all inhabit different kind of basic habitats. Now for our myota species, they were a little unusual in that we found that um, when we were talking about roosting site and looking up the literature on that, there was some indication that Fires could destroy roosts. Um, some of these species roost under loose bark on trees. And so we felt that there was some indication to give these a score where there would be some negative fire effect on roosts. However, for all of these species, they are strongly positively associated with um, fires of all types when it comes when, with respect to foraging. And so they um, tend to be more common and thought that's because it makes for a better foraging site. And so for each of, the, uh, each of the bats, we have two different maps. The rest of the species were, um, we didn't notice that kind of pattern, and so they have a single map created. So bringing this all together, um, we have our fire type layer. We have our expected distribution under future climate changes. Then you have your response scores. And when you combine these, you get something like you see on the far right here, where this is actually for one of the myotas where we, we I thought it was a good idea to consider these forest fires with torching as likely to be um, representative of those conditions where it might lose the roost site, so we gave it a negative score there. And so wherever you see red here indicating high fire risk are areas where its suitable habitat under future climate change is uh, overlapping with areas with those types of fires. And so you can see that it's only a few areas. Um, there's large swaths down here where fire risk appears to be minimal. Just to show you what this looks like over time, so we have 2030, 2060, and 2090. Um, by 2090, there's a lot of habitat lost or loss of potential suitable habitat. But um, down here in the Gila, this is actually a wilderness area. You have areas that look to be good as far as fire risk and areas that look to be more problematic here outside of Santa Fe with respect to fire risk. And so you can start to identify areas on the landscape maybe with different management focus. So I wanted to show you our other endangered species. This is the New Mexico Meadow jumping mouse. And so we have our fire risk map for 2030, 2060, and 2090 here. And the first thing I think that's apparent is that um, this species did not experience a lot of loss in predicted suitable habitat over time. I think we have 20% of the currently predicted suitable habitat, which isn't shown here, um, is lost by 2090. And interestingly, the strongest predictors of the species were um, biophysical characteristics, so elevation, slope, uh, distance to river, obviously, and things. So the climate effect doesn't appear to be too dramatic for the species. However, you can see a lot of differences in whether um, these areas are in high or moderate fire risk. And so if we blew this up, you can see this in greater detail and, and um, overlay it with management units and things like that. So this is just to give you a feel for how these look. And so we have, um, we're combining here the impact of climate on the species with the potential risk that fire may pose to those same habitats. So it's important, I think, in talking about species niche models and um, even the fire risk maps to identify what it's good and not good for. So I think that these are great products for estimating the magnitude of impact. You have some species which are expected to experience great loss, others less so. That's informative. Um, it also can provide information on potential refugia or areas that might need additional interventions, especially with respect to fire. It's um, these products, which are all available, and I'll show you that towards the end of the pre uh, presentation today, are also great for scenario-based exercises and planning actions. Importantly, they are not useful for actually predicting where you're going to find species in the future. We're talking about 
um, locating those areas that look like they're going to be suitable for the species based on what we know about where it is now. However, that doesn't mean the species is necessarily going to move there. The things like dispersal ability and potential um, competitive and predator interactions could really influence um, where species end up. It's also not a great way to predict species adaptive capacity. Again, I just mentioned dispersal ability, nor is it great at um, looking at those indirect exposure and sensitivity factors that could influence um, what you see for these animals. So this brings us to the vulnerability scoring system. So this is our third step that we took with all these species to kind of integrate um, all of these different data sets that we're bringing in here. So we relied on the system for assessing vulnerability to climate change that was developed here at the RMRS. Um, and this is a system, a standalone vulnerability scoring system. Um, it's based on 22 species traits, and it pertains mainly to vertebrate species, but these traits are um, present in all those species and are predictive of species response to climate impacts. And they deal with things with adaptive capacity traits, um, they include exposure measures, as well as traits that might indicate um, sensitivity levels. And it also includes, as I said, it's standalone um, traits that relate to habitat use, physiology, phenology, and biotic interaction. And since we are already um, we're using these models for habitat, we did modify this system a bit to exclude the habitat questions. And so we're not really supposed to read this right here, but I just wanted for you fast readers, you can kind of get a feeling for what these questions address. We have things about food, predation, um, life history traits, and kind of over on the right-hand side are what those traits pertain to as a kind of an indicator of adaptive capacity, is it a sensitivity, because even that's not completely covered in those impact analyses. So you go through this, um, you get a calculation, and it gives you a score like this. And so these are our 12 species, and the greater the score, the more vulnerable the species. Um, some of these species, like our introduced American bullfrog, um, actually appear quite resilient. And so if we look at these results really quickly, too, we see that uh, most of our species on federal lists, southwestern willow flycatcher, or western yellow-billed cuckoo, and the New Mexico jumping mouse, all come out as highly vulnerable. And this is not surprising. A lot of times when you do these vulnerability assessments, species which are currently of conservation concern are so because they have habitat issues, and those habitat issues are likely to get worse in the future. Um, similarly, having your invasive species as somewhat resilient to climate changes is also not unexpected because they have many characteristics often that lend them increased adaptive capacity for dealing with variation. So, this is a scoring system. It helps you identify those uh, problematic species here. It doesn't give you a really good view of how this is working across the landscape. And so we combine this with our species distribution model using something called a risk matrix. And so the risk matrix essentially plots the magnitude of impact, expected impact with disturbance or climate change along this axis, and then the likelihood of that impact occurring along the other axis. And it gives you, in that way, um, your target will come up somewhere in here, and it could be in the red, which is a high-risk area, and you really need to do something about it. Or maybe it gives you uh, something that comes up in the yellow area, which is that less risk. So we use our measures of habitat change to represent the magnitude of impact that's uh, affecting our species. And we use those scores that we just generated to represent the likelihood that those impacts with climate change would have a negative impact on the species. And a little bit more about these risk matrices. I think anybody that studies is probably thinking I'm giving a really brief overview of it, but you know, time is short. Um, they, the risk matrix, this type of analysis, is, has been around a long time. It's used a lot in the security industries, even public health, but it's recently seen a growing popularity within natural resource management situations. And that's because risk analyses are very helpful for identifying or distinguishing between management strategies, particularly when you have a situation where you don't have enough time or enough resources to address all your risk. And it does so um, in a fairly objective manner. And so here again, we have our risk matrix. Now, we're not the first ones to use this to combine these different types of data outputs. Um, it was first applied by Iverson on trees in 2011. 
And then there was a number of case studies um, in the recent forest sector science synthesis that um, used these for a variety of um, different, we used it for birds, but other people used it for social settings and things like that. So um, they're very amendable to modification. So if we look at this for our species, this is showing you all of the species all together on the same chart. If this is of interest to you at all, really um, go to that final report because I described the process a little bit better, more thoroughly, and then all the species are broken out by their taxonomic groups, so it's a little easier to read. But right away you can see that most of the species that we assessed in this study fall within this red zone, and it's in the near future as well. So we have the years here in the shades of the different um, colors and shapes, and the colors and shapes represent the different species. But this red zone represents very high climate risk, and then in our management need, we have immediate for all these reds. Other species, though, don't reach that red zone until 2090. You can see up here our two amphibians, too, tend to stay in that moderate climate risk zone at least until um, the 2090 time period. Then over here, we have one species in the green zone where it's expected to potentially get a benefit, and this was if you recall, our hispid cotton rat. And so the hispid cotton rat turns out it's not very vulnerable to species. Oh, I should have mentioned the axes, so I'll do that in a minute. It's not very vulnerable to um, climate impacts as well. It had that huge increase in expected suitable habitat. But since that expected suitable habitat in the future has so little overlap with current predicted suitable habitat, I think this could be overly optimistic. And so just to go over the axes, and I'm sorry I didn't do that first, we have habitat change down here, starting with one, which is our current distribution, and then declining all the way to zero. And then you have the increasing going the other way. On the vertical axis, you have vulnerability, where increasing vulnerability is likely to mean that you're going to be more negatively impacted by climate impacts. So these can be really useful for prioritizing actions amongst different species. And and of course, all the species come out in red. It's hard to prioritize, maybe, but there's some more urgency in some of these than others. Uh, okay. So this brings us back to kind of the framework, the overview of what we've done here. And so I've talked about each of these impact models, our ecological niche models, the fire simulation. Again, the reports have a lot more information, as well as some websites that I'm going to refer you to shortly. Um, and then we had this vulnerability scoring system. And we have all of these products that have been made available to anybody that wants to use them, as well as some of the process where you can modify them to your own needs. We also have a lot of the climate data and data layers for these niche models that are available for anyone that wants that. And so I thought um, a good way to end this would be to show you where you can look and find more information and to show you um, this really neat conservation planning atlas that the LCC has got up and running. And so. First, though, I'm going to take you to our own site, the Armourage Project page. Let's see. Oh, this is working quite well. All right. So I'll leave it like this. So here's our project page. It's been here the entire time the project's been here. Um, so if you've been here before, uh, I just want to point out here now on the right-hand side, we have some project products. And so you can go to these various places and um, get more information, and I think this is a little bit more digestible than looking at the final report, which just kind of lays it out one after another, but go to the fire analysis, if you click on some of these highlighted areas, you either get a definition or you can go to additional sites where you get more specific information and kind of just a feel for what you're going to look at there. I really wanted to show you, though, the species niche model analysis page. And so if we go here, again, a little bit of background. And then here we have all of our species, and more importantly, we have these species reports. And so these are shorter booklets that summarize all of the habitat um, change data, the fire risk map, and the vulnerability assessment scores. And with those vulnerability assessment scores, you get a lot of background on the species because we justify why a certain question was given a certain answer. And so you get a lot of information out of that. And again, this just might be a nicer way to access the information then downloading a 200-page report. So that's the RMRS page. Um, I also want to take you to the Southern Rockies page. And now I'm going to open. Oops, I'm sorry. Okay. 
Okay, we're going to go to where I already have stuff open. Okay, so here is the main Southern Rockies Conservation Cooperative page um, showing you the Conservation Planning Atlas. And so this is a really great platform to find projects that have been sponsored by uh, the Southern Rockies and as well download data and um, play around in their mapping application, so visualize the data. And so it's very handy. Um, my project right now is right here, highlighted down in the kind of middle of the page. So we're going to just skip over there like I've clicked it. And this is what you get for all the different projects. You kind of get the title, a little brief here. You can get the final report here, and I forgot to point that out on the RMRO site. But since we're here, you can get this. You can also get all the project data that's associated with this project that is available or demonstrated on the site, I should say, um, by clicking this link. If you click this link, you would get this page here. So here you have a zip file where you can access all that information. That might be a little too much, so maybe you just want to explore the data. And so in that case, if you look over to the right here, it shows you what your gallery contains. And it has, it says here, 78 data sets and 22 maps. And so you'll get this for all the other projects, too, which is kind of nice to get a summary. But if you scroll down, here you can see the maps are listed first. If we continue scrolling, we have the data sets, and there's two folders here, and then we have all the species habitat. Okay. And so essentially what these maps are, are they, they're groups of those data sets. These are essentially single layers for one time period, one species, uh, here it's suitable habitat, you know, one variable, whereas these will be sets for all the time period. And so I'm going to go ahead and initiate um, opening this in their mapping application. It takes a little bit of time, so while that's loading up, I am going to, and I think it's just taking time because I'm in this program for presentation. It's actually pretty quick. But now while we're back here, I want to show you some of the features because I think this is really great. So you see this little check mark pops up, and I'm just going to click that because it gives you this, I don't know if you call it a pop-up or a pop-down, but this allows you to access some options. You can export this straight into a PowerPoint if you wanted to, as well if you, uh, as well if you hoover over these, um, you get this other action box, which allows you to open in the map, which I just clicked for um, another layer. But you can also export this map, and this time you get some options for exporting it as an image, which is nice, and then again you have your PowerPoint option there. Um, if you click on the name, the name, you get to go to another place where you can export the data as well. But here you can see what I mean, that it actually this map is a package that contains multiple data layers. So we have one for the 2030 time period, the mid-century, and the late century. And so, um, I guess I didn't want to go back to, okay. Yeah, I just want to go to the data really quick and show you a similar thing. So I'm going to check one of these. You don't have to, but it just pulls into place a little bit. So you also get the export buttons here. But here you get quite you get a little bit of a different option on the uh, data set layers. You can open it in the map, and I just opened a map, so we won't do that. But you can also download it directly from this site. And so I just will end this looking at the map. So here I open a mapping, a map data set in the mapping application. And so you get a little review here, quite nice. Here on the right hand side you have the legend and there's some options that you can use up here. I'm going to click this layer tab on the left hand side and you can see all the different layers that this map contains. So I'm going to click the American Bullfrog 2030 as well. Um, you can change the background. So if you click this, you have all these different backgrounds. We're going to leave this for now though. Look back at those data sets because I'm going to show you one of these tools. I think it's a lot of fun. Um, so you have basic zoom. If you have an account, you can save these maps, as many as you'd like, I think. You can also export it even if you don't have an account. So that's really nice, showing you what you would see in your export. But over here you have some basic tools, identify button, measuring, and then the swiper and the calc analyzer. So I haven't used this, but I have used the swiper. I think this is fun. And so I don't know if you saw that. I'm going to unclick it. But I'm going to click it again, and you'll see over here on the left-hand side you get this little blow up. And so you can shift this up here. I'm going to shift it between two of my layers. And so you see how this popped up here. And it allows you to kind of do a before and after. And so it's kind of fun stuff. So um, a very handy way to visualize this, especially if you don't want to get into ArcMap and all that stuff. I think this is a really great resource. So that said, I think that's plenty. And 
all I have for today, so I'll hand it over to Mary again. All right, thanks, Megan. We have a few minutes left, and so I'd like to open up the webinar to questions that or comments that you may want to um, share with Megan. You have two options for asking questions. I encourage you to ask by phone if you like, and that's easy to do. All you need to do is unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone keypad. When you're done asking Megan a question, it'd be helpful if you remute your remute yourself by pressing star six again. And uh, you can also type in a question into the chat page, which should be either on the right side of your screen or you gotta click on the viewing Megan Spriggan's desktop and there's a little chat box and you can type in a question there and send it to the host and I can field it to Megan and um, she'll answer your question that way. So we'll just, you know, hang on for a second. Um, feel free to unmute yourself by pressing star six. If we have a couple folks, we'll just kind of wait in the queue and then uh, you can ask a question when the first person is completed. Megan also provided her email address up on that slide if, if you need to contact her. I'm sure she welcomes any uh, inquiries. Megan, do you have anything else that you want to, um, that you maybe forgot to add or wanted kind of a take home message while we're waiting folks to um, for formulate questions? Uh, you know, I was just thinking that myself. Um, I just, uh, I don't know if I emphasized or came out that we have a number, part of the goals of this project were to produce data that can be used by other people as well as this kind of process for integrating it. And so we have a lot of data that's available and it's not necessarily all up online, but you can contact me and access any of it. Um, I can send you zip files or whatever. And so I don't know if I mentioned, but the climate data layers, all the species distribution models, even the max to output, whatever somebody might be interested in using for their own analysis. Okay, great. Is anybody out there ready to ask a question? Yeah, um, this is uh, Kevin Johnson. So, Megan, could you go back to the slides that showed the Southwest Willow flycatcher um, over suitable habitat over time? So if uh, what, how this could be, this is my question, could this be interpreted while we understand that this doesn't, this information doesn't tell us that Southwest Willow Flycatcher will be in these suitable habitats in 2060 or 2090. What it does tell us though is that if we are looking to do conservation actions, whether it's restoration or manipulation or protection of Southwest Willow flycatcher habitat today, we can use this to target where we anticipate that uh, habitat will still be viable in the future. Is that, yeah. is that correct, how we could use this? Yeah, I think you stated that really well. Yes, I would say this is a great way to think about the worst case scenario. And if indeed things get drier and um, habitat starts to change, if this analysis is telling us anything, it's where those areas that are likely to remain suitable over the long term. And for the southwestern middle flycatcher, we didn't see a shift in range, and that might be due to the boundaries of our study site, but we saw a lot of withdrawal into certain refugia across the landscape. So. Um, that's the primary use, I would say, for it. So then is there an opportunity, a way to overlay multiple species and see where locations uh, will remain suitable through, through time, where those uh, areas would remain suitable for multiple species, therefore getting the biggest bang for our buck? Yeah, yeah, and you know, and I had a previous version of this talk where I actually show that for the birds, and, and this area you're seeing on the slide, and if you saw that one, you may have, um, actually encompasses the Bosque del Apache Wildlife Refuge, and all three birds 
are predicted to, um, the, the, that remains good habitat for all three species over time. And so um, we're definitely doing that. We're doing that a little bit with the bat work. I'm working with somebody at U with USGS here in Albuquerque, as well as with the birds, and we're writing that up and getting some peer review um, input on that. And so that's a great use for it, because you can definitely identify those biodiversity hotspots. And it's just the timing of this presentation. I didn't include any of that cool stuff. So thank you for mentioning it. Hi. Um, this is, my name is Paul Tashin, um, hydrologist with Fish and Wildlife. And uh, I think it's really cool. I guess there's a little bit of a caution or concern I have is that with river processes, and um, future hydrology scenarios for the river and the sort of interplay between future hydrology and geomorphology and how important that is for those species like the flycatcher that are very tied into that riverine habitat. Um, yeah, I, I just, just a little bit concerned about using the, um, your approach to simulate what those habitats are going to be like. I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. So. You mean where the models might be saying that this new habitat looks to be suitable, but we're not including those geomorphic? Geomorphic, geomorphic. or hydro hydrologic, like how the actual hydrograph is going to shift. We've done, we've done that sort of work in terms of trying to come up with these climate change hydrographs for the Rio. Um, and for those species that are really tied into that riverine habitat, yeah, I mean, that's, that just seems like that would be uh, um, a really important driver and where those suitable habitats are going to be in the future is how the river responds and then, and, and then how the hydrograph responds. Yeah, I totally agree. You know, we had, um, we did not, we assumed that the river would continue to flow along the sweep, which could be a big assumption um, given some of the future expected changes, I think. We did include, you know, things like runoff and evapotranspiration. We were hoping as for some of those things that weren't included directly in the model. And maybe the including, I don't know if the work that you've done could be something that could be included in this type of analysis. Like, uh, you know. Yeah, I would, I, we have done some of that work, and, and we've talked about oh, that. that would be very cool. So, yeah, that would so, yeah, be cool the, yeah, for us to talk offline about that. I, that I think, yeah. Definitely. If we worked with what we had, and we were really focused on that one, uh, Bureau of Reclamation data set because we didn't have the time and capacity to to uh, create our own hydrological uh, variables. And so um, definitely that's probably a shortcoming. I think that this still gives you, you know, if you blow these up, you get a lot more detail. And I was just trying to give an overview here. I think that it can still get you to areas and then maybe you can explore further in greater detail some of these four different species because I'd say for a number of species it may not just be the presence of water, but it could be other things that weren't included in the model. And that's something where you can kind of integrate those kind of variables into the vulnerability scoring process. And so you may not see it spatially here, but you will get it ultimately when you start looking at risk analyses. Yeah, cool. So yeah, but I would love to talk more about what you've done. So Great. Please email. Okay. <laughs> Alrighty. Cool. Thanks. Megan, uh, we have one question that was sent in via chat. I'll read it, read it to you. It's from Dave, and he asks, it appears that eradication of tamarisk is quite successful in many areas of New Mexico. Will this improve habitat sufficiently to reduce sensitivity to a warmer climate? Oh, um, I would like to say yes. You know, I'm not a tamarisk expert, but I do know that uh, you know, and that's tricky when you talk about the birds and some of this debate about whether or not um, they are using the tamarisk in an absence of sufficient natural vegetation. You know, there's all this nesting debate. I don't think I should get into that right now. But in any case, uh, I, I think that that is a very viable method for increasing the resilience of the systems to future climate change. Anything where you're preserving those natural communities, uh, vegetation communities, I think improves resilience, uh, you know, and that's not only the species, but the area that's being um, managed and the, you know, the reducing fragmentation and having multiple sites where you can have um, reseeding and stuff like that. So I, I, would, I would like to say yes. Thanks, Megan. 
I don't see any other questions. I'll just give uh, the folks on the phone if they want to. Anybody want to ask one more question via phone? That would be great. Um, let's give a few seconds here and see if anybody comes in. It looks like we don't have any more questions, so I'm going to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, Megan, first of all, I'd like to thank you today for presenting. And I'd also like to thank our audience for attending the webinar. And for those of you who joined late, we will have a recording of the webinar uh, available in about a week on the Southern Rockies LCC website. Also, please check the website for our June 18th webinar with Lindsay Reynolds. Lindsay will be presenting on climate change and repairing forest communities. So goodbye, everyone, and enjoy your day, and thanks again for attending.